All right, now, of course, Mark 16, a very, very famous portion of Scripture we'll be focusing on here, verse 15. And he said, Unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Of course, this is the Great Commission. This is why we're, we're so focused on, on soul winning in this church. It's about reaching the lost. You know, and this is a commandment. I want to start off with this. This is a commandment from Jesus Christ saying, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus is commanding us to go out and do this work. And it's not just for his disciples. Obviously, he's speaking to them here, but this is very applicable for us today. Even just common sense will tell you that um, you know, it's our job based on a multitude of scriptures. I'm not going to go into all of that this morning um, on the scriptures telling us that we have to go and, and everything like that um, because that's just a subject for another sermon. I preached on that before. We're going to get a little bit, a lot more into the mechanics and, and how do you do it and just real practicality of, of giving somebody the gospel. Now, I'm going to start off with this. So the hardest part, I believe, of going soul winning is actually going out and do it. See, you hear these commandments a lot. You know, Jesus Christ, everybody knows the Great Commission. You know, anyone who's been in church for a little while has heard this before. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We say, amen, yes, that's good. And a lot of people take that to mean, well, I support the missionary work that they go out and they preach the gospel to every creature. But, and they kind of absolve themselves of that responsibility. But no, this is something that, that we're all supposed to do. If you're saved this morning, you need to tell others about that great gift of salvation that God has given you and, and, and tell them about it so that they can receive it as well. But the hardest part is actually just going out and do it. It's one thing to hear it. You could sit in church and be like, yep, that's right. Yep, we need to go soul winning. But are you doing anything about it? And that's, that's the key. And I think, you know, first you have to make that decision that you will do it. Right? You have to decide in your heart, you have to decide in your mind that, yes, this is what Jesus said, this is what the Scripture says, this is important. If I love people at all, I'm going to share the gospel with them so that they can avoid an eternity of hell. You have to make the decision in your heart, am I going to do that? Am I going to obey God? Am I going to love people enough to just open up my mouth and tell them about this amazing free gift? Am I willing to do that? Hopefully everyone here this morning is, is, is saying yes in their heart, saying yes, I am willing to do that. I would like to do that. Well, the next hardest thing I think is going out to do it because you have a, a fear. And that's typically what, what keeps a lot of people from actually going out, especially knocking on doors. Some people are, are okay with you know, bringing up conversations with friends, with maybe people that you're comfortable with. You know, um, I know there are a lot of people that, that will do that from time to time. And amen, good. I mean, you ought to be doing that and do it every opportunity you have. But we need to go out. We see all throughout Scripture the command to go. Go into the highways and hedges. Go out to people. Go out to the lost. There's a lot more lost people in the world than just your friends and just your relatives. We need to reach a lot of people. And I'll tell you what, no one else is doing it. It's not going to get done. There's entire families that don't have anybody saved in their family. You can't rely on just, oh, well, I'm going to speak to my family. What about all those other people that don't have anybody saved? And what we have today is a bunch of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses going around and preaching a false gospel and not enough of God's people who are saved bringing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to do this. The Bible says... Um, you know, again, I, I think one of the things that people, that Christians struggle with is this fear. And if this is something that you struggle with, if you're afraid to go out, because look, I understand this completely. Let me start with this. I understand this fear 100% because this is something that crippled me for a while with soul winning. I have by nature been a very shy person. I'm a computer person. I'm not, you know, I'm not... That not been the most social. I always had a small group of friends. I wasn't one to just be friends with everybody. I wasn't one to be able to stand up in front of people and speak. It scared me to death. The only reason I'm at to the point where I'm at now is because God has worked in my life and God has made changes. It's not because I'm some great speaker, some great person, and I have some great skills. Because I don't. I've just allowed myself to, to just listen to God and, and to do what I believe He's calling me to do. He's told me to do something. I'm just going to obey him and trust that he's going to work through me. Whether that be at the door out soul winning or whether it be behind the pulpit, I'm just going to trust that he's going to use me because I've offered myself to him to be his servant and to do what he wants me to do. God has created the tongue. And we're going to see that. I think that's later tonight. Um, 
I've got another sermon kind of lined up back to back with this one that's very similar and related to it. But, um, you know, people struggle with fear. And if this is something that you struggle with, which it's important to understand this, that that fear does not come from God. It's not a godly thing to have to fear going out and talking to people. The Bible says in 2 Timothy ver, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you're afraid to go out and talk to people, that fear does not come from God. It's not a godly fear to have. The only fear that we ought to have is a fear of God. We ought to fear God and keep His commandments. That is the only fear the Bible says that we ought to have in our lives. So if you have a fear of going out and talking to people, hey, you need to decide, I'm going to overcome this fear. Now, what's one of the best ways to overcome this fear is you need to pray. Okay, number one, pray for some boldness. Pray to God. Go to God. Hey, we've had multiple sermons on prayer in the past. Believe that God can answer prayer. We know that God hears us, especially when it's with something that you know he wants you to do. God will help you, but go to him, speak to him, talk to him, and ask for some boldness. Excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 6. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 4. But Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking at the end of Ephesians, and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What's he doing? He's asking people to pray for him, saying, look, pray for me that I might have the boldness to preach the gospel. And he says, I mean, that's why he's in prison. He's in prison for doing that very thing. This is the great apostle Paul who went out and, and preached the gospel to, to every creature. You know, his hands were clean from, from so many cities because he's, he's gone and witnessed and, and, and you know, given people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet he's still praying for boldness. He's asking God, he's asking other people, pray for me. Pray that God will just give me the boldness that I need. Why do you need boldness? Well, oftentimes because, you know, he experienced a lot of persecution from people. And usually when you have a fear, it's associated with what is the person going to think or do at the door. That's what your fear is. There's a fear of this unknown. What's going to happen? I'm going to go and knock on some person's door. What's going to happen at that door? I don't know. And you start getting afraid. What if they, what if they yell at me? What if they call the cops? What if they, you know, slam the door in my face? And, and you start thinking of all these what ifs. And it, and it starts to give you a spirit of fear. When in reality, oftentimes what we end up doing is we kind of conjure up some things in our mind that we make them a bigger deal than they ought to be. A lot of that stuff, it really isn't a big deal. And anyone who's gone out knows this. And, and, but it's something you just have to learn and, and learn to get over. I've had the door slammed in my face I don't know how many times. But I'll tell you what I do. I go to the next house. Okay, you can't just take it personally. It's not that big of a deal. If someone shuts the door, okay, you just keep on moving on. Because I'll tell you what, there's going to be people that do want to listen, that do want to hear. It's not just all in vain. This isn't just something that just never works. It works well. There's a lot of people out there that are interested in hearing the truth and hearing about Jesus Christ. Yes, there's a lot of people that don't want to hear it at all. Forget those people. Just move on. You're in Acts chapter 4. We're still talking about praying for boldness because we need to get over this. If you have a fear of going out, if, whether it be talking to people at work, talking to people in your family, talking to people at the door, it doesn't matter where it is. If you have a fear of bringing up the gospel because it's been ingrained in us in this culture not to talk about religion because it's taboo, forget that. Don't listen to this world. Don't listen to the wisdom of this world. We need to listen to God and obey His commandments. Acts chapter 4, look at verse number 25, 29. Excuse me. Verse number 29 of Acts chapter 4 says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Here we see God answering that very prayer. This is why I'm telling you to pray for boldness. We have an example of this happening in Acts chapter 4, where he says that with all boldness, 
they may speak thy word, speaking to God. This is their prayer to God, saying, look, give us boldness that we may speak your word. And in verse 31, God pours out his Holy Spirit on him, his Holy Ghost. He fills the whole place with the Holy Ghost. This is not the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. They already had that. They were saved. Jesus Christ already breathed that into them. This happens later in Acts chapter 4 where God, and God can do this today. God's Holy Ghost can rest upon us. He can fill this place with the Holy Ghost when we pray unto Him. And it's, and what did they do? When they prayed, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They spake the Word of God with boldness. That's the result of being filled with the Spirit, being filled with the Holy Ghost. Jump down back to verse 13 of Acts chapter 4. Because this is an important point to make as well. Verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and, un and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now my next point is that you know maybe you're not afraid of just talking to people because you're afraid of talking to people or what they might do. Maybe you think that, well, I don't know the Bible very well. I'm, an, I'm ignorant. I don't know a whole lot. So I don't really want to go out and do this because someone might say something and I won't have an answer to them. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're saved this morning, you should know how you got saved and you can tell other people how you got saved. But one of the things we're doing today is to help you be able to use more scripture. Now, one of the things we do when we go out soul winning is we bring our Bibles with us. We bring God's word with us. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Obviously, we need faith to be saved. We put, need to put our faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. That's the requirement. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How is a person going to believe unless they hear and they need to hear the word of God. It's not just our explanations. And get the, this is an important point. When we go out soul winning, we bring the scripture with us, whether it's with us in our mind or it's with us in, in, on paper. We need to, sh to give people God's word because God's word is where the power is. God's word is what's going to save. The Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, not the word of man. Now, you might think that you just have this great explanation. And look, I use illustrations too. We're going to get to that. I use examples, and I kind of tell people generalities to help them to understand. But if that's all I ever did was just to say, just generalities, and you know, all you have to do to be saved is to receive a free gift, and you're saved and you're saved forever. If I just kind of explain that to someone without using any Bible, that person will not get saved. It's impossible for that person to get saved because their faith has to come by hearing the Word of God, not just my examples or illustrations. Now, again, examples, illustrations, they're great because they can help people to understand God's Word, but God's Word is where the power is. God's Word is where the truth is. Hey, Jesus Christ is the Word, and I've mentioned this before, just as much as we need Jesus Christ to be saved and our faith on Him, we need the Word. Jesus was the embodiment of the Word. We need God's Word to be saved. We need the Bible. We need to preach God's Word for people to get saved. So this is number one. When we go out soul winning, bring your Bible with you. Now, you, might, you don't have to know everything in this book for someone else to get saved. Now, should you learn and, 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 you know, and have an answer for anyone that asks of the blessed hope that's within you? Of course. You know, but that's going to come with time. It doesn't mean you just don't go at all and wait until you feel like you've studied enough. Don't buy into that for a second. We see many examples. We just looked at the woman in the well on Wednesday. Um, the first thing she did, she got saved from Jesus Christ. She went and told other people about Christ. You know, she didn't have to know all the ins and outs of doctrine and be able to answer everybody's questions. She wasn't able to answer everybody's questions. But she got saved and she pointed people to Christ. And everybody today can do that. If you, as long as you're saved, you can do that too. And we're actually commanded to do that. So don't back off. Don't say, well, no, I need to do this. And it's interesting because Peter and John were perceived as ignorant men by the world. They weren't the scribes. They weren't the Pharisees. They weren't people who were, you know, so-called like studied and just and well reputed as, as knowing the scripture and God's word. They were ignorant men, you know, but 
they had been with Jesus and they had the boldness to preach God's word because they had been with Jesus. They learned from Jesus. And if you're saved, you have Jesus in your heart and you can go out and you know, get that boldness and preach the gospel. Now, I'm going to get into a lot of the practicalities and um, you could follow along with one of these if you'd like. Go ahead. Uh, those are the old ones. Here you go. <laughs> you know, pass that out. These are the verses that we're going to be going to. They're the same ones that are in the bulletin. And I'm just going to just practically explain like, like my method of soul. And again, this isn't the only way to do it. This isn't, oh, this is the way you have to go out and preach the gospel. No. This is the way that I go out and, and, and preach the gospel to people. And I'm hoping that it'll help you as well. Maybe you could pick up some points. Maybe you could pick something up from this. But we're, turn to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to get there in a minute. So we're going out soul winning and we knock on a door. Right? Now, and here's the other thing too. If you've never gone before, Look, you can be a silent partner because in, in this church, typically we go out two and two. We send people out in, in pairs. So if you've never done this before, at least just go out with somebody else because we always have one person doing the talking and the other person is a silent partner. And this is a great way to get started. This is a great way to learn. It's a great way to see. Now, it doesn't mean you can never do the talking or anything like that because you should. But... If you're nervous to help you get over that fear, you can take one step of just saying, okay, well, I'm not going to say anything, but I'm going to go out with this person. I'm going to listen and just kind of learn and observe and see what they have to do. That will help you to get over that fear. That'll help you to, to release some attention so you could see, oh, this really isn't that big of a deal. And that's what I did. And honestly, I did that for months, months and months and months of going out and not saying a word because it took me a long time to get over that fear. So look, I, I, again, I understand where the fear is coming from, but you still need to understand. If you, if you could look at the Bible and say, this is something I had to do, and that's a decision I made myself. I said, the scripture is telling me to do this. I know it's my responsibility, so I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to make myself do it. I've, I've made myself do all kinds of things in the past that I wanted, because ultimately I did want. I mean, it's, it's an ultimate goal to be able to say, you know what, I want to be able to lead people to Christ. I don't want people going to hell. This is something I want to do. You got to learn how to get over that. So what I did, I went out soul winning for every single week for months and months and months and just listened before I finally was able to open up my mouth and start saying it. And I'll tell you what happened. The first time I gave the gospel to someone, it was a young, it was a, it was a, a teenager and I fumbled with my words. I had a hard time finding the scripture. I dropped my Bible in the middle of talking to him. Okay, it was not smooth at all. That young man got saved though, which proves it's not my power that got him saved. I feel, I mean, I did a terrible job of trying to do this, but I was using God's word. God saw that and the Holy Ghost was able to, to work through that exchange and that person was able to, to put their faith in Christ because they heard God's word and believed it. It's not the messenger. It's not the greatness or the power of, of the messenger that brings us. It's the message. It's Jesus Christ and what he did for us. That's where the power is and that's where the salvation comes from. So if that can happen with my situation, it could happen for anybody. Don't think that you have to be some great speaker and be able to, to use all these great examples. Look, just go out and do it. God will use you. God's strength is made known in weakness. And... Um, so let's look at our first verse. So when we get to the door, I was mentioned being a silent partner, but when we get to the door, first thing we do is obviously knock on the door and we start off by inviting people to church. Just say, hey, my name is Pastor Burzens. I'm Pastor Burzens from Word of Truth Baptist Church. You know, I just tell them a little about it. It's like, he's a brand new Baptist church. We're out inviting people to church today. Do you have a church that you normally go to? Just to break the ice. I mean, just someone comes to the door. What are you doing at my door? Hey, I'd like to give you an invitation. That's why we bring our, our invites with us. And um, just to break the ice. And then they say, oh, okay. You know, like I already have a church or whatever. They could give you any type of answer on, on do they go to church and what church they go to. It doesn't matter what the answer is. 
Because the next question is always going to be the same. It's going to be, okay, well, more important than church or going to church, if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you'd go to heaven? And that's how we get started with the gospel. Now, it's a great question to know. It's a great lead-in to know because that lead-in of just asking about church and then switching over to do you know for sure, because this is even more important than church, you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. If you die today, would you go to heaven? Are you sure about that? You can use this not just at the door. You could use this in your personal life. You could use this with friends and relatives. Maybe you already know what the church they go to, but you could start talking about, hey, I go to this church. I really like it. But, you know, even more important than that, or are you still going to that church or whatever? More important than that, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? That's, that's a great opening because that gets you right on track and, and sets the course for the whole conversation. You're talking about knowing for sure that someone's going to go to heaven. And based on their answer, you know, a lot of times people say yes. If they say yes, I'll ask, well, okay, how do you know that? You know, what, what, do, you, what do you believe? You know, what, what, what is it that is going to take you to heaven? And they'll give an answer. And oftentimes people will think, oh, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, I've, I've done good works. I've helped animals. I've done, you know, fed the poor. I go to church, whatever. All these, all these different works answers. I'll then follow up and say, well, can I show you some verses out of the Bible that explain what the Bible says it takes to be saved? And, you know, you're not trying to just like, Drive the back, like, you're wrong, oh, you know, like all this other stuff, and you know, get them in in this defensive mode. You're not doing that. You just just say, okay, well, can I just show you, you know, some verses out of scripture? I explain that a little bit, and um, you know, if they're real adamant about being saved, yeah, I'll, I'll say that, you know, if you're trusting it works, you're not. But I kind of show you that, you know, kind of show you some scriptures about that. But um, a lot of times, though, people will say, well, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, which is the right answer. Right? Or they'll say something similar, you know, I've asked Jesus into my heart, or you know, I've given my life to Jesus. There's, there's a lot of different things that people can say. But you say, okay, well, that's the right answer. So the next thing I'll follow up with then is, well, do you know for you know, is there anything you can do where you can lose your salvation? And there's a very good reason for doing this because what that question does is it is it helps get to a person's heart in what they truly believe. And here's what I mean by that. If you believe that you can lose your salvation because, let's say, you know, I always like to bring up extreme examples. Of what if you were to go out and just murder somebody and kill yourself or something, you know, what if you were to do that? Would you still go to heaven? And what that digs down to is, is a person's belief. Are they trusting in the law to be saved? Are they trusting in those works in obedience to God's law? Because if you think you could lose your salvation, then you have not fully trusted on Christ to save you from all sins. Past, present, and future. To save you from every single one of your sins. That would mean Jesus Christ did not pay for all of your sins if you can do something like that and then go to hell. Now, it kind of goes against the grain. People typically, they're like, wait, what? What do you mean? You know, how, how can you do something like that and still go to heaven? But it's because they're trusting in their works. Again, it's how can you do that? Well, none of us are good. And that's where we get in with Romans 3.23. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So basically, what you know, I'm going to kind of skip over some of the, the intro stuff now. You talk to someone, let's just say you know, they don't know if they're going to go to heaven or not. And you say, well, can I show you from scriptures? Right? Here's the next step. You say, okay, they're willing to listen, right? So I, the first place I go to is Romans 3.23. And I explain, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, the great thing is with soul winning, too, is that you don't have to have everything memorized. You don't have to have a whole speech ready to go that you say the same exact words every time. It's not like that at all. But if you can just just learn some of these verses, especially the ones that we're going to be looking at today or some other ones, and even write down the verses that you like to go to. Just write it down in your Bible of, of what verses you like to show people. You can go off of that and just say, okay, well, I'm going to show you Romans 3.23 first. 
And then you can start explaining it, because if you understand this verse, everyone should understand this verse, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, it's, it's just something to say, look, we're all sinners. Do you know anyone that's perfect? Because I sure don't. I don't know anybody that doesn't sin. And every once in a while we find someone who says that they believe they don't sin, but they're lying, because the Bible says right here, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Now, it's important that we show people about their sin first, because if people don't believe they've sinned, and then in the next step, they don't believe that there's a punishment for their sins of hell, then what do they need to be saved from? Right? It makes sense. They wouldn't, they, they're not going to need salvation unless they understand that they've broken God's laws, that they've done wrong, and that there is a punishment for those, for those sins that they've committed of hell. And it's a serious punishment. This, this is something that needs to be understood in order for them to realize the need for a savior. So we go to Romans 3.23, explain, hey, look, everybody's sinned. We all come short. None of us are quite good enough. Even if you've sinned in the best, the good things that you do, we still don't quite measure up to God's standard. And I always say, well, just because we're all sinners doesn't mean it's okay, right? I mean, people tend to think that, oh, well, everybody does this, so it's not that big of a deal. Well, in God's eyes, it is. And I turn to Romans 6.23. And in Romans 6.23, I'll explain where the Bible says here, for the wages of sin is death. And I stop there. I don't get through the whole verse right yet because we're dealing with the bad news first. And again, you can read the whole verse. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just telling you the way that, that I typically give the gospel to people. For the wages of sin is death. And I explain, you know, a lot of people these days, unfortunately, because people are becoming more and more ignorant especially through the public school system, for the wages of sin is death. Not everyone understands what that word wages even means. So I always just, just throw it in there and make a point to explain what are wages. Wages, you know, I always say, have you ever heard of minimum wage? A wage is something that you earn. It's something you, you, you make. You know, when you go to job, when you go to your job and you work, your, you know, your boss pays you money. Those are called your wages. You've earned that. You've, you've, you've worked for that. So in like manner, when we sin, We've earned something for ourselves. But we haven't earned a good paycheck. We've earned death. This is not a good thing. And then I explain that we you know we we physically we're all gonna die one day. There's no getting around that. Right? I don't believe this is talking about physical death, but the Bible talks about a second death. Okay? After we physically die, there is a second death. And then I bring them to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And I'll read verses 14 and 15 of Revelation chapter 20. Where the Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So basically without getting into the whole like, you know, hell being cast into the lake of fire, being relocated, I just say, what is this talking about? What is this second death talking about? What do you think it's talking about? And they'll basically say hell. Because it is. I mean, it's all about hell being relocated to the lake of fire, and that's the second death. They say it's not a place where anyone wants to be. Typically, you don't have to explain to people what hell is. They have a good understanding of what it, of what it has to do with. Fire, brimstone, torture, torment. And sometimes I'll even throw in there, you know, the worst part that I believe about hell is that it lasts forever. It's an eternal punishment. And um, if someone doesn't quite get that, you can, you can jump up just real quick to verse number 10, where it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I just, just real quickly, it's in the same section as other places you go to. But it shows that the torment and the torture happens forever and ever. And once you're in hell, you cannot get out of that place. So it's a place we want to make sure we don't want to end up. So then I'll ask people, say, okay, you understand hell. You know, and a lot of people, they believe hell's real already. They believe heaven's real. So I'll say, well, what do you think? And it's good. This is important, too, to take note of this, to engage people in conversation. Because you get them thinking. You don't want to just preach at them. You know, when you're going through the gospel, you want to be able to talk to them and have a conversation because you start preaching at people. A lot of times they'll mind us out to wonder if they just don't like what you're saying or, or they'll just space out. And they'll start thinking about something else. 
But when you're having a conversation with someone, it's a lot harder to do that. I mean, you're talking to someone, you're expecting a response. So when you just ask questions and engage people, it's going to be a lot more productive because you're going to get people actually thinking about this a lot more than, like I said, just preaching at them and just telling them all this stuff and telling them the answers. You want to get, you know, get them really thinking about it. So I ask, well, what do you think a person would have to do in order to go to hell? And the most common answer is, you know, do something really bad, you know, really bad people like committing murder or something like that. that. That's what people typically think today. I say, okay, you know, fair enough. Well, let's look at Revelation 21 verse 8. And it's real close to where we just were, just a few verses down. Revelation 21 8. And I say this gives a list of, a list of people, a list of sins that we can do to go to hell. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I'll say, look, I mean, there's your murderers, right? There's a lot of bad things on here, maybe things you've never even done before. But then I always point out, but look what it says right here. It says, all liars. Now, have you ever told a lie before? I mean, most, 99.9% of people will say yes. I've, I have had like one or two cases where someone says no. Oh. But <laughs> they're just lying right there. Lying. Yeah, yeah. They, they proved it right there when they, when they said no because they just lied. But, um, you know, typically people will say, yeah, of course. And then I'll explain to you that, you know, how many people does a person have to be kill, have to, have to kill before they're called a murderer? Just one. You kill one person, you're a murderer. You don't have to kill 10 or 100 people to be called a murderer. You kill one person, you're a murderer. Well, it's the same thing with liars. Okay, you tell one lie, now you're a liar. You don't have to be telling lies, because people like to think, oh, well, I don't, I mean, I don't tell lies all the time, you know, maybe that's just talking about habitual liars. No. If you tell a lie, you're a liar, if you ever have told a lie. And this says all liars. It doesn't say some are really bad. It says all liars. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is important to hit home because this is saying that you might think that you're a really good person. You might think because you've never killed somebody, you're okay that you don't deserve hell, but that's not the way God sees it and that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that, and, and, and I like to also just kind of say, we're in the same boat here, okay? I've told lies. I've done things wrong. You know, I've sinned too. We've all done this, but according to God, we all deserve that punishment of hell. That's what we all deserve because we've broken his commandments. He made the rules. He's the one that decides the way it is. He's the judge, and this is his judgment. This is what we deserve. Now, it's important that people can, can get this and understand that and be okay with it. If, if they still don't believe that, you know, you might have to go to some other verses. I'm not going to get that deep into it today. But most people can understand that. And then, but then you say, but do you think that God wants every person to go to hell? I mean, God loves us, right? Of course he loves us. He doesn't want us to go to hell. God's not, you know, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So then I'll turn him to Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 and just show them what God says about his love toward us. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even though we're sinners, while we were yet still in our sins, God still loved us and he loved us enough for Jesus Christ to come and pay our price for sins on the cross. And this is where I really go into Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, his resurrection. Um, there's a lot of things that people don't believe about Jesus from different backgrounds, different religions. So it's important to go through the, you know, the gospel of Christ and what, and what he did for us. I'll start off typically by saying, you know, the Bible says, I usually say, I don't know what you've learned about Jesus, but the Bible says that he was God manifest in the flesh, like God became a man. Because if people don't believe in the right Jesus, that other Jesus that they're believing in can't save them. There's only one Jesus that can save you. He's the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh that saves you. Explain a little bit about Jesus. Explain that he lived a perfect life. He was without sin. Jesus did no sin. But um, 
he died on the cross. They nailed him to the cross. And, I, and I'll explain that when, uh, um, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, that he bare the sins of the whole world in his own body. And he took our sins upon him. Upon, upon him and he died on the cross. But then I'll ask the question, again, to keep, keep people engaged after I explain about Jesus. But do you know what happened to Jesus Christ after he died on the cross? Do you know what happened three days later? He rose again from the dead. He came back to life. And he did all of that to pay the punishment for our sins. This is what we need to explain to people. And um, oftentimes I'll explain to you that, you know, the punishment for our sins, we saw, right, we need, we're going to go to hell to pay for those sins. Well, Jesus Christ came for those three days and three nights that he was, that he was dead in the grave. The Bible says his soul was in hell. Which only makes sense because he had our sins on him. He was bearing our sins for us. He paid for our sins as well. He paid the eternal punishment. But he rose again from the dead, giving us that hope of our resurrection, of our, of our salvation. And then um, I'll explain that, you know, Jesus Christ, he died for the sins of the whole world. He died for everybody. It wasn't just a few people. He died for everybody. But do you think that every single person is going to go to heaven when they die? And again, most people will say no. You know, we already, we already read about people being thrown into that lake of fire. So obviously not everyone's going to go to heaven. So here's the key. Well, what do we have to do? And mind you, you know what I'm preaching. This is a conversation with someone at the door. All, you know, everything I'm saying, obviously, um, hopefully you can, you can pick up on some of this and use it for yourselves. Then I turn to Acts chapter 16 and verse number 30 and 31. Because we've explained Jesus Christ. We've explained what he did for us. We know, we know we're sinners. We know we deserve hell. We've heard now that Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. He died on the cross. But it still doesn't make sense. I mean, we're, we're not, all, not everyone's going to heaven. So what is the difference? What separates someone who goes to heaven from someone who goes to hell. What do we have to do to be saved? And, and as, we're, as we turn to Acts 16, verse 30, I'll, I'll be explaining to the person just to try to not have any dead time in between while you're flipping through the Bible. And I'll, and I'll explain, you know, there's a man that asks the question. One time in the Bible, he asks, you know, what do I have to do to be saved? So let's look at that. And then, you know, when we get there, I like, to, I like to show people this verse too. It's, it's you know, um, I don't always turn every single scripture. I like to um, when I can. But this is something if, if, that I really like people to see and to read for themselves from the Bible. And that's why you'll see my Bible is highlighted. This is the Bible I take out soul winning. It's not highlighted because I need to know where the Bible, where the scripture is, although that can help you too. If you don't know all the references, if you don't know which, you know, which verses to go to, highlight them for yourself. So then when you're flipping through the Bible and you can't remember, oh, I can't remember exactly where that was, you'll be able to see the highlight and be like, oh, okay, there it is. Right? It's a good, it's a, it's a good useful tool to have. I have these memorized. I know where they're at, but it also likes to have it highlighted because when I'm, when I'm holding it for the person to read, it's the highlighted section. You know, it's real easy to follow. Um, just a side note. But um, I turn to this and say, well, look at what he says here, verse 30. And brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's a great question. What do I have to do? I want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. And then verse 31 has the answer. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And I'll ask, so what does the Bible say right here that we have to do to be saved? What is it? What do we have to do? We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll ask, does that say that you have to go to church every week to be saved? I said, no. Does that say that you have to be baptized to be saved? No. Does that say you have to live a good life to be saved? No. It doesn't say any of that. You know, and, and, and I'll kind of list a lot of things that people maybe tend to believe in. Does that say you have to give up your sins? Does that say you have to go to church, be you know, whatever? All these other things that people like to add to salvation. It doesn't say any of those things. It says one thing. It says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I'll ask him this. I'll say, well, now if there's anything else that we do have to do to be saved, let's say there is something else. 
When this person, when, when the Apostle Paul and Silas give this man this answer, if they don't give him the, the full truth, yes, what must I, what do I have to do to be saved? If there's anything else, they lied to this person because they didn't tell him the whole truth. I said, do you believe that they just lied to this person in Scripture here? Because I don't. This is exactly what it says. And I also bring, point out where it says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people today will say they believe in Jesus. You, know, you just believe in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, they believe. And what people mean by that could be all kinds of different things. It's one thing to believe that Jesus Christ was alive and he physically existed and that he died on the cross. Right? Anybody can believe that, but it doesn't make you saved just to believe that he was a real person, just to believe that he existed, just to believe that he, you know, that he did these things. When it says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what you're doing is you're staking your salvation on Him. You're believing completely on Him, which means you're not believing on yourself. If I thought that I had to do good things, if I had to help people out, if I had to obey the commandments, my belief is on myself. Even if I said, well, you have to believe on Jesus and do good works, right? Well, then not all of my faith is on Jesus. I'm not believing on Jesus alone. I'm believing on Jesus and me. But we need to believe on Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and on Him alone. It's no works of our own. Everything that what He did. We're relying on Him. We're trusting Him alone to save us since He paid for our sins. And that's why I explain to people. And I'll say, you know, this isn't the only place in the Bible that tells us to believe is there's all we have to do to be saved. And I take him to John 3.16. And John 3.16 explains, so this is a real famous verse. You know, a lot of people have heard this before. But this says exactly, this repeats exactly what we just saw when the man asked, what must I do to be saved? And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So again, the only requirement in John 3.16 for a person to have everlasting life is to believe in Jesus Christ. And then I'll say, and again, it says it right here, two verses later, John 3.18. Because it's right there. It's just below John 3.16. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And I like to explain to people that that verse to me is very simple. It makes it, 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 it um, points out the fact that there's only two types of people in the world. There's those whose faith is on Jesus Christ to save them, and there's those whose faith is not on Jesus Christ to save them. If your faith is on Christ, according to the Bible, you're not condemned. And condemned sometimes is a word that people don't always understand. Um, so I'll explain that to you. You know, condemned is basically you're guilty before God. Since Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins, when you put your faith on Him, you are no longer guilty of those sins before God because He acknowledges what Jesus did as payment for your sins. It's no longer, you're no longer guilty of those sins. You're no longer condemned. I also explain, you know, another way to understand condemned in this, in this context is being damned to hell. Right? You're not condemned. You're not damned to hell. You're, you're forgiven in God's sight, so you're no longer guilty. And, um, and then it says, He that believeth not is condemned already. And the Bible says, why is he condemned? Because he didn't believe. Because he didn't believe on Jesus Christ. That's what the verse says. So it's very simple. It's very straightforward. There's those that believe and those that don't believe. And then I'll even turn sometimes to John 3.36 that says... Um, <clears throat> He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Again, saying, if you believe, you have everlasting life. If you don't believe, it's the wrath of God. So, you know, over and over again, I like to stress that point where the Bible is saying, it's believe. It's faith. It's only faith in Christ that's going to save you. It's not anything else. This is what Scripture says. So then, uh, this is at the point typically where I'll flip back to Romans 6.23 because I told you before, I usually only read the first half of that verse. So I'll say, okay, 
Let's go back to the verse because I don't like just reading half of a verse. We're going to read the whole thing now. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we deserve, the wages for our sin is death, but God's got a gift for us. And now here's where I'll use an example of a gift. And examples are great for trying to help get these truths across. People have these barriers when you get, when you get just inundated with false doctrine your entire life or you hear things over and over again, it's hard to break through that. So sometimes these examples can really help people to fully understand. And I believe that's why God gives us these examples of, um, you know, for example, a gift. He chooses his words carefully. When, when we're talking about eternal life, he says it's a gift. And I'll really break down at this point, what is a gift? And I'll, and I'll just put the Bible aside for a second and say, okay, let's talk about a gift. If I were to give this Bible to you for a gift, but then I said, you got to give me a dollar, is that still a gift? No, of course not. And look, these are all simple questions, but you know, the reason why I do it this way is because you're really trying to bring this point home and get people to fully grasp and, and, and pay attention to these words. It's easy to hear the gift of God's eternal life, but we need them to understand what that means. It's a gift. You don't pay for it. And I'll say, okay, what about if I don't ask any money? But I say, I'll give you this for a gift, but you have to go wash my car first. Is that a gift? No, you didn't pay for it, but you earned it. You worked for it, right? A gift, in order for a gift, by definition, to be a gift, it has to be free. People typically give gifts to people because they love them. Say, so, you know what? I want you to have this. I care about you, whatever. You know, it's your birthday. Here you go. Have this gift, right? Now, do you have to accept a gift from me? If I offer this to you and say, oh, I'll give you this Bible. This is a gift I want for you. Do you have to accept that from me? No. You, could, you have the free will. You could refuse that gift. Say, you know, I don't want that. But let's say you do want that gift. And you accept that gift from me. You reach out your hand. You take this Bible. Who does it belong to now? It belongs to you. Right? It's no longer mine. I'm giving the gift away. Once I give it to you, that becomes your property. That belongs to you. So I'll ask people then. Okay, let's say I give this to you today. But then during the week, you go out. You start lying about me. You start spreading rumors. You know, think, not true at all. And you just slander my name and start talking all kinds of bad things about me. And then I come back and take that back from you. Is that right for me to do that? Of course not. not. If I've given it to you as a gift, it's yours. And if I come back and do that, then that means I'm stealing. Right? That means I'm a thief now. Because and Now look, is it right for you to go out and, and say all those bad things about me? No, of course not. But two wrongs don't make a right. It's not right for me then to just steal something back away from you. Now you shouldn't have done that. But that doesn't mean that it gives me the right or the authority to come back and take that gift away from you. Now, God's gift to us, he says, is eternal life. So if God gives you a gift, do you have to pay for it? If it's a gift, no, it's free. Do you have to earn it or work for it or do good things for it? No, it's a gift. It's free. And I'll say, what if you were to, to, to say some bad things about God? What if you were to break God's commandments? Is he going to take that gift away from you? Well, it wouldn't be right if he's truly given it to you and it's yours. It belongs to you. If he takes that back, that would make him a thief. And God, we know God's not a thief. But even more important than that, the Bible says that God's gift is eternal life. You know, I'll ask, how long is eternal? How long does that last? Long time, right? Forever. Eternal life never ends. So if you have eternal life, are you ever going to die? No, it's life that lasts forever. Now we know our bodies will physically perish and they'll, they'll, they'll pass away and go into the ground. But we have a soul. We have a spirit, right? This is going to continue on forever. When we have eternal life, hey, that life lasts forever. And I'll say this, if a person goes to hell, is, did they have eternal life? No, this refers to hell as death, right? So once God gives you something, if God gives you something and he says it's eternal, he says this is going to last forever, but then you do something and it doesn't last forever for whatever reason, that would make God a liar when he says this is eternal, this is forever and it's given to you. If that does not last you forever for any reason, God's lied to you because then it, became, it, it changed from eternal life to temporary life. 
But if we can trust God at His word, we know that if He says something is eternal, that means it lasts forever. This is one of the examples that I love giving because it kind of helps things to click with people. Oh, because you can hear a lot of this stuff and still not quite get it, quite understand and grasp the freeness of God's gift. So then I'll explain in my kind of last point with this gift thing is that if I were to give you this Bible for you to receive it, if you wanted to accept it, all you have to do is reach out your hand and take this Bible and it's yours, right? Well, I can't reach my hand up to heaven and grab eternal life from God. So the way that we receive is a little bit different. And I, and I like to ask people, how do you think we receive that gift? And, we, and, and sometimes I'll have to give them a hint and say, it's the same thing we have to do to be saved, right? You put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and that's how you receive the gift, when you put your faith on Him. And um, if they still don't get that concept of the gift, the other thing I like to do is explain being born again, John chapter 3. I'm not going to get into that too much detail because I'm, I'm way out of time. But um, in John chapter 3, we explain, you know, I, I usually explain that I've got three daughters. You know, they all have one birthday. They were born at one time. And I have rules for them. I expect them to follow my rules. I have commandments. They're not perfect. They don't obey me all the time. But is there anything that they can do where they would no longer be my children? Of course not. No matter what they do, they're always my children. And I'm always going to love them. If I'm a good father, I'm going to love my children no matter what. Now, sometimes it might need, mean they need discipline, you know, but I still love them. I'm still teaching them and training them. But um, nothing they can do would make them cease to become my children. They'll always be my children. And it's, I just explain, it's the same thing with us and God. When we're born into his family, when we're born again, when our spirit is born in, uh, within us, I show him John 1, um, you know, but as many as received him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's when we become God's sons, God's children. He becomes our father. We become his children. We have one spiritual birthday, just like you have one physical birthday. You have one spiritual birthday. That's the day you're born into God's family and nothing can change the fact that God is your father and you are his child. Nothing can change that. Whether if you break all of his rules, if you don't listen to any of his commandments, that does not make you no longer a son. You're still his son. Now, that does mean he, as a, a loving father, is going to chastise and discipline you all along the way. And he's going to do that if, you know, because you are a son and not a bastard. But I'm not going to get into that too much. I'm going to wrap up with this. So then the last thing that we do, and I, and I believe in this, and this has come up recently with some friends of mine. Um, the last thing I like to do after I explain salvation, you know, explain that people are sinners, explain the punishment for sin is hell, explain God's love, explain the gospel, explain Jesus Christ dying, being buried, raising again from the dead, show people that it's just by faith, show them it's just believing, Explain that it's eternal. You can never lose that salvation. Once you are saved, man, you are saved forever. It's eternal life. It's a free gift. It's not based on your works. The last thing I like to do then is recap with people. And I'll go to Romans chapter 10 and recap with them. But in Romans chapter 10, um, or no, sorry, when I recap with people, I just kind of go over the same questions. Just say, okay, so let me ask you a few questions. Do you believe... You know, you're a sinner. Do you believe that the punishment for sin is hell? Do you believe, you know, all these points that we just covered, do you believe that? And then I'll say, you know, if you believe these things, then let's just bow our heads and tell God that your faith is in Jesus Christ to save you. And, um, then I'll show them Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then in verse number 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I'll say, look, this is why I like to lead people in prayer, because you could just tell God from your heart that your faith is in Christ alone for you to be saved. And I'll typically tell people, look, I can word this prayer. I'll help you through it. You know, you can just repeat this after me, but I'll explain that, look, this is a prayer to God. 
This is not a prayer to me. Don't say things to make me happy or anything like that. This is between you and God. So if you don't believe something, then don't say it. Now, this is a great opportunity as well to make sure that you have done your job um, in explaining everything properly. Because people can look like they're agreeing with you and understand, but when it comes to them like opening up their mouth to God in prayer, if they don't believe something, they typically won't say it. And so what we do is, y'all, you know, I, I kind of word a prayer saying, you know, God, I know I'm a sinner and I know I deserve hell, but I believe that you died on the cross and rose again for me. You know, please save me. I'm only asking you, you know, I'm, I'm only trusting on you to be saved. And, um, you know, amen. Basically, I just, just, just something along those lines. And it's not always the same every time, you know, it's just, it's just kind of reiterating the fact that they're a sinner, they deserve hell, but they, their faith is in Christ. He, he died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. And, um, you know, please give me that free gift of eternal life. And that's it. And um, I've had people, sometimes I've gone through the gospel and I thought I was being real thorough. And I get to the point where I say, well, I deserve hell. They won't say that. And it's a hang-up for them. And see, it's easy. It's every once in a while, you know, we, we want to be very, very careful that we're being thorough with the gospel because... There's no point in going through this. I mean, it's, it's not going to do any good if you think the person's saved and especially if they think they're saved and they're not really saved. Because we just, I mean, it's not that it's difficult to get saved because it's not. But it's based on your belief. And if someone's not believing right, maybe you didn't spend enough time in a certain area, you know, that's going to do more damage than good for them just to think that they're saved and everything's just fine. So... There's a lot of, you know, a lot of re repetition, uh, when I go out soul winning especially, there's a lot of repetition. I like to go over things and really make sure people understand it and that their belief is in the right place, that it's just in Christ and it's not in the law whatsoever. I mean, we have to understand that our, our penalty for sin is, is hell. Otherwise, there would be no reason for Jesus to come and die on the cross. Because if we weren't worthy of that punishment, then that means we could avoid that punishment somehow by our good deeds and through our obedience to the law and that we're not really that bad. And then why would Jesus have to come if that's the case? But salvation is not through the law. It's through grace and um, through faith in Christ Jesus. And I didn't bring this up, but when I, when I, the, my favorite verse in the whole Bible for soul winning, especially is John 5, 24. And I put that in the bulletin today. But um, as I was mentioning earlier, to me, See, eternal security is huge. You can't leave out eternal security. You have to explain to people that you are saved forever because that really rings home with the fact that Christ paid for all sins, past, present, and future. You are saved through what He did. It has nothing to do with yourself. John 5, 24, I tell people, look, this is a promise made by Jesus Christ. If they're having a problem with this eternal security stuff, look at what Jesus said in John 5, 24. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And there's so many things I like to point out in that verse. One is that he says, if you believe, you hath. That word hath is an old word that means you have it. You have it right now. Again, if you have something and it is everlasting, it lasts forever, by definition, if it doesn't last forever, then it, you never had it. You never had everlasting life because it didn't last forever. In order for you to have everlasting life, it has to last forever, right? I mean, it's try not to get too confusing with that, but it's... But it's, you know, it's, it's a fact. No but that's right, absolutely. But when people are lost, sometimes they struggle with, with this, this understanding. But it is, it's a no-brainer. Um, but then he says, not only do you have everlasting life, though, but he makes it even more clear because he says, you shall not come into condemnation. Now, does that say you shall not come into condemnation unless you kill somebody? No. He doesn't put any condition on it. He says, you shall not come into condemnation. He says, you've passed from death unto life. See, when we're all sinners, before salvation, before you put your faith in Christ, everybody is headed towards death. Everybody is headed towards hell because we've sinned. We come short of the glory of God. But after you put your faith in Christ, you're born again. You are no longer headed towards that death. Nothing, you can never go to that place. You've passed from death unto life. It's a one-time thing that happens. 
You need to get saved one time when you put all of your faith in Jesus Christ. This is my method for soul winning. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's the only way. It's a way, okay? And, and it definitely gets results. We always want to make sure we're being thorough with people and spend whatever time is needed. Now, you don't need to be getting in arguments and just, just when people just want to argue back and forth, that's not going to be productive. But when people are listening, maybe they're not quite getting it, spend whatever time is needed. Love that person. Care for them. Care for them as if it's your own mother, your own father, your own brother or sister. How would you like it if someone tried to give your brother or your sister the gospel that's not saved and they just got irritated because they didn't understand and they just, just, just left? Say, okay, well, I got I to gotta move on to someone else. Spend the time. Love that person and, and, and give them that time. Hopefully, um, hopefully you picked up some kind of tips today and, and you know, I'm willing to go out. I, I have got a, a relatively flexible schedule. If anybody wants to come soul winning with me, and, and kind of see more in practice. This is, this is really the way that I do it. I mean, anyone who's gone out with me, Sebastian here will tell you, this is, this is exactly you know, what the things that I say. Um, obviously, if people aren't getting it, I'll, I'll go to more scripture and say more, but there are a lot of people where everything that we just read is, is more than enough for them to understand and just to believe on Christ and to get saved. And um, you know the Bible says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. Um, it's something that we ought to incorporate and make it a part of our regular life. Something that we do regularly. Whether it be daily, weekly, I mean just make it a part of your life. Whatever that may be. And um, hopefully you know, you're able to learn something from this today. And I want everyone to be prepared for the, the soul winning marathon, excuse me, on, on the 16th. It's going to be a great time. And like I said, hey, look, if you've never done this before, if you're not comfortable, just come and be a silent partner. Yeah. Just come and listen. It's, that's taking that first step, okay? Get over that fear. It's, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm still here, okay? I'm not, I've never been beat up. Although that possibly, potentially could happen. I mean, it's never happened. I've never had any really bad thing. I mean, people might say some nasty comments. But that's another reason why I like to bring my little girls with me because people have a tendency to be a lot nicer when you have a, you know, a three or four year old <laughs> little girl standing at your side. They're not going to curse you out as much, right? <laughs> but if you don't have that advantage, you know, still don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. You know, I'm sure we've all been called names before. We've all had, had people say some nasty things. It may not be pleasant, but you just move on. And, you know, honestly, you know, <laughs> When people are just really rejecting of the gospel, you, you can, you know, especially if people are just hurling insults at you, you can take a little bit of comfort in the fact that it's sad, but that person's going to end up in hell. Mostly, I mean, uh, mostly people are, that are responding that way to you, they're probably not saved. You know, they probably don't have the Spirit of God in them when they're just going to, if they're just going to rail on you for coming to their door. And, um, and that's their loss. It's not your loss. Don't take it personally. You're there out of love. You're there to help them. If they don't want that love, then fine. Move on, move on to somebody else. Let's bow our heads and word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for the great gift of salvation, Lord. Uh, I pray that, that you would please help us all. Help us all be better soul winners, Lord. No matter what stage we're at, if we've, if we've never gone out before, if we've never witnessed to someone before, Lord, help us to get over our fears. Help us to just decide that it's important that we're going to go out and do it. Lord, if we have done it before, just help us to become better. Help us to learn more scripture. God, help us to, to be able to make your words plain and easily understood. Help us to be thorough, dear Lord. And um, God, we love you. We thank you so much for the wonderful you gift you've given us. Stir up our souls. Stir up our spirits to go out and share what you've shared with us and what you've done for us with other people, dear God. There's a lot of people who are on their way to hell. And Lord, um, just help us to reach as many of those people as possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.